Hey YouTube, Marshall here. Welcome back to The Realignment. Today's episode is a little meta because I'm talking about the future of cable news, the decline of that business model on a show you're watching on YouTube. I'm speaking with the author, Catherine Kramer Brownell, about her new book, 24-7 Politics, which talks about the history of the cable news medium and how, as we near the end of that era, given the collapse of the cable bundle and the fact that people aren't subscribing as much or tuning in, what the possible futures for the way we consume and learn about the world could look like. Hope you all enjoy this conversation. Catherine Kramer Brownell, welcome to The Realignment. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm really psyched to talk with you. It's interesting. I am someone who used to work at PBS. I then got into podcasting, doing this independently. Um, but as we were discussing before the episode, I'm working at UT starting this week, and I'm also like a think tank fellow. So I'm both at the very centralized end of media and also the decentralized side of this. So there's a million things I want to ask. But let me just ask you this first question. This book and so much of our basic mainstream discourse about cable news has been, it's degraded the medium. It's entertainment. It's vapid. That, on the other hand, is the opposite of the narrative we have around cable television in general. So we could say things like, well, look, in the 1960s, there were only three channels, but the TV wasn't that great. By contrast, the rise of cable gave us Game of Thrones, Oz, Sex in the City, like quality programming across like ideology and viewpoints, all those different things. Why did the rise of cable not produce what we would describe as higher quality news and public discourse in the way that in the entertainment and culture categories, the rise of cable did produce something that was obviously better than what came before. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is a central question that I get at in the book. And I think that it's it, they're linked, right? We have more options as consumers. We have this deregulated media environment that allows the marketplace to triumph and to, to kind of shape some of this programming that emerges. And so as consumers, we have more choices than ever before. But those same pressures, those same market expectations also have seeped into our, our news and our understanding of public affairs. And so somewhere along the way, and this is something I chart in the book, that the, the public interest uh, that has always been long associated with news productions on television uh, became connected um, and intertwined with the consumer interest. Um, and this is part of deregulation. It's part of the regulatory uh, battle that I chart in the book. And by the 1980s, and especially in the 1990s, there's a triumph across the political spectrum. And I cannot emphasize this enough. It's not just Republicans. Um, it's Democrats who are very much a part of this conversation and are pushing through deregulation. Um, and they're arguing that the consumer interest is the public interest. Uh, Mark Fowler, the head of Reagan's FCC, uh, said it very powerfully and very clearly when he said, what interests the public is the public interest. And this is a shift away from these ideas about delivering information, the civic responsibility of news organizations that really dominated and allowed them to have so much power during the 1960s. So I think if I'm going to play a cable executive here, which I wouldn't want to play because of business <laughs> model structures, you know, struggles that we'll get into, obviously, though. But if I'm going to play cable news executive, they'd say, what are you talking about? We obviously have entertainment content, but at the same time, we've obviously advanced the public interest. Like think of CNN um, in the 1990s, you see the Gulf War for the first time. It's available 24-7, um, you know. All those guys in the 60s were great, but they're only on for one to two to three hours a night. We've brought it 24-7. Help us kind of unpack the claim that you're kind of asserting our current news media ecosystem doesn't reflect the public interest in a way that the prior model for all its flaws may have more. Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, I, I don't want to romanticize this moment where we were so well informed in the 1960s because of TV news. And that is not accurate at all. Yeah, you know, TV news in the 1960s is 22 minutes. Um, it's very, it was very deferential to official sources. Uh, there's a tight collaboration between broadcasting executives and people in the White House. Um, uh, and uh, and it's very elitist. It's very, um, it was, uh, it's very centered on a white 
liberal male um, elite perspective. And so it's very exclusionary and it was not the full picture. Uh, but there is this expectation that media corporations, um, uh, news, uh, television uh, corporations had to produce some type of public affairs programming. Um, and, and so they do this in bits and pieces. Um, again, there's a very small news section, uh, but there also are, are documentaries. Um, and so there is this, it's kind of always over their heads that they know, um, and, and people like Newt Minow, uh, as the FCC chairperson, uh, makes it very clear that he's gonna be watching and to see if uh, the, th these major networks are upholding this public responsibility that they have. Uh, and so ultimately, this, this does kind of shift away. Regulations are pulled back. It allows for new voices. It allows for new types of programming to come in. Uh, but there's not this expectation that the news has to um, has to inform, uh, um, and uh, it becomes more focused on entertaining. And I think that our understanding of the news uh, does not necessarily change. And so people think that they're turning in to CNN or Fox or M MSNBC, and that they're getting information about the world around them today. They're getting that that kind of old fashioned idea of the news. But in fact, um, overwhelmingly, what they're getting is entertainment, and that can inform, that can be presented in a really compelling way. You can have you know coverage of breaking news. And I think cable news has played a really important role in uncovering uh, certain things and documenting certain things. But the line between entertainment and informing uh, always tends to veer more towards entertainment. Mm -hmm. And that's a historical development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think something that'd be useful here is for you to unpack the history here, because someone's probably going to wonder, well, why was this even up to the government um, in the first place? FCC's role, the regulatory structure. So how about you take us to 1948, um, Astoria, Oregon, from Oregon. So fun little shout out. Um, but so like what how does the like, how does the rise of cable as a technology specifically play into the dynamic you're discussing? Exactly. So television emerges on um, that you're getting your television signals on the broadcast spectrum. So they're coming over the air. And so the idea is that broadcasters are renting, basically. Uh, they're, they're using this public space. Uh, the, the air is owned by the public. This is what the FCC determines. And so they, there can only be, there have to be some rules about who can use what spectrum. Um, and that's how they regulate licenses. And so the, the, the kind of deal, if you will, that the FCC FCC crafted for broadcasters is that they could have this spectrum, they could rent, you know, this public uh, space, uh, use this public entity, um, and but they had to also serve the public interest. What that was, uh, was really up in the air. It was not very clearly defined. Um, and so that ultimately becomes uh, defined later on. Initially, cable was just a technology that allowed broadcasting to extend its reach. And so in the book, I talk about Ed Parsons, who is an engineer in Oregon, and his wife wanted access to the Seattle uh, broadcasting signals. And they lived in a, a town, uh, Astoria, a small town that was far away, and they couldn't get access to those signals. So he went on top of a hotel, uh, you know, found uh, a way to get those signals, and then used a coaxial cable uh, uh, to then bring that to the, their TV set. And so that's really, it's a very basic function in terms of accessing signals. And initially the FCC saw cable as just a way to expand broadcasting. They didn't envision that it would offer something different, that it would offer perhaps its own programming, that it would offer a very different business model. That ultimately develops later on when people are frustrated uh, by the monopoly of the big three networks and kind of this exclusionary nature of their programming both entertainment and news. And I think what I'd love to understand here, because the technology, this is such a technology driven story, especially if we're going to engage with the how maintainable was that pre 1970s pre Nixon status quo, separate from individual political decisions that he would make. So when you're describing renting the airwaves, is there a limit? to this, I mean, even the language we're using isn't even correct. Is there like a limit? So for example, um, on the internet, like zeros and ones, like there's, there's no limit to, yeah. 
um, the number of sites you get out on the web. So it would be kind of strange to be like, well, CNN, you're renting this yeah. space on the internet. Was there a limit to the number of broadcast signals that a NBC or an ABC or a CBS could get access to before cable? Yeah, so that's such a great question. And you're right, renting is not like that kind of involves like an ex like you're paying money, right? But in fact, they did pay money uh, for accessing the, the the broadcast spectrum. And there are there, there's a sheer limit. Um, and so uh, uh, the the broadcast TVs operated on the VHF spectrum, the very high frequency spectrum. And only a few people can uh, to, to get a clear signal. You can't have. 20 different people trying to, you know, uh, broadcast on that signal. And so it's very, it's a technological aspect. And uh, you're right, it's about, it's about technology that there are only a certain number of broadcasters who can use that signal to reach television viewers. And so initially, it really starts with radio and t TV kind of follows in the same regulatory structure as radio, because, you know, radio is wireless broadcasting, but over uh, just audio. And, um, and initially, the 1920s, there's there's all of this confusion um, about who gets to use the spectrum. And so that's where the FCC kind of comes in to say, okay, you get to use the spectrum during, uh, and this particular spectrum during these hours. Try to, just trying to create some clarity so people can actually get their programs and their ideas out there. Yeah. And that's such a helpful explanation because I think it's easy to read your book or the Atlantic article I'm linking in the show notes and kind of say, well, why was the government even putting their hands in there? You could think about that from a left, right, or center critique perspective. Well, because to your point, there was kind of a public goods problem. There's a limited amount of space. Um, and obviously, if there can only be three or four channels, uh, the question of the degree to which these channels serve the public interest would actually be a logical way of determining who actually gets the spectrum, right? If you're doing, you know, garbage TV circa 1934, I think there's a much stronger argument for NBC um, to actually take that spot. You're thinking about it that way. So that's actually super, super helpful. So then let's talk about um, the 60s in terms of the various different uh, sets of folks who were very much unhappy with this status quo. So for example, um, like in your piece, you describe leftists weren't happy with this. Um, you you had um, economists who weren't happy with this. Conservatives weren't happy with this. And then finally, people in favor uh, of free expression weren't um, in favor of the status quo. You, you could take those or like in whatever order you want, but like what was like the central critique of that 60s, what we kind of think of as a heyday now? Yeah, it's really interesting because they, they could all really kind of agree on the critique that this network television model was exclusionary, that these big three corporations, uh, which had these affiliate relationships with local broadcasters, so they provided all the programming that local broadcasters then would, uh, you, you know, get, uh, uh, you know, beam out on their signal to um, tell our living rooms across the country. And so it's these big three corporations that are dominating what Americans are consuming what they're what they're watching uh the advertisements even that are getting on you know so an economist would talk about that this is really limiting the business potential of small businesses because you've got these major corporations uh that are buying ad spots and there's only a limited amount of advertising um and so uh, th their criticism is that th this is a monopoly that does not reflect uh, the diversity of opinion and ideas and potential programming and and this is at a time i really i think the Another key component here is to know that this, this frustration with the limits of access to um, television is coming at a time when TV is seen as increasingly important to political power, to gaining political power, to winning elections, uh, to getting your ideas out there, to pursuing social change, whether it's on the left or on the right, that Across the political spectrum, people see TV as a means of political power, and they're being excluded from having access to it. So it really becomes intertwined with political debates in really significant ways during the 1960s. And this is where we could bring big political figures into the picture. You've got um, LBJ, um, Nixon. So uh, LBJ's, you know, Great Society addition to this dynamic would be public broadcasting, you know, PBS, public television, um, where, you know, I actually got my start. And funny enough, like I got interested in politics because I watched like the news hour, you know, with my parents. So obviously I'm going to shout out um, PBS and the work they do there. But um, 
the critique that Nixon would make of this is that operationally, um, essentially, uh, you know, PBS is elite liberal television programming, adding that as the fourth um, station, quote unquote, isn't going to address the conservative side of of, of the diversity argument. I guess what I'd, what I'd ask you, um, studying this history and kind of looking at a polarized America, it, it, was there ever any world where you could successfully build a public option like literally it's in the name of public option um, for the dispersion of public interest television that didn't inevitably become, you know, polarized because once again, like I said, huge fan of NPR, but you know, PBS, but it's in New York city. It is a institution mm -hmm. that's going to favor people with college degrees and graduate degrees um, at a structural level. It's going to lean left. Um, so it'd be kind of difficult to imagine how you would structure things differently. Like, how do you think about that dynamic? It's a really great question. And there are some really brilliant scholars on um, educational television and public television that would say, absolutely, there is a possibility because there is a lot of effort. There's a lot of interest in educational television, something that was and it was framed initially as educational television. And then, uh, um, and then the name kind of emerges as public television. But the idea is th th the same is that if you're not bound to commercial pressures, like so, you know, public television emerges as something that's different from the networks that, um, that again, across the political spectrum, not only they, were they exclusionary, but, um, but they were focused on profit, right? They're, they're focused overwhelmingly on entertainment and not enough on educational and public affairs programming. And so there's a lot of support for this. You know, major foundations like the Ford Foundation invested a lot of time and money into studying this and kind of coming up with these alternatives. And, uh, and so I think that's, you know, th there's, a, and, and like thinking about kind of the ideology that this is inherently liberal, I actually, I, I think that the scholarship says that that's not true as well, because um, there's, I'm on the, the scholarly um, advisory board for the American Association of Public Broadcasting. Uh, there, there are, um, their, their archive, the, the AAPB archive, which is amazing. And they've got some really incredible exhibits that actually show conservatives are taking advantage of public or educational television um, in the 1960s. Um, William Buckley's show, The Firing Line. I worked you know, on Firing Line. On I worked on the reboot. Exactly. That was my, that's my origin story. So that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so I think that conservatives recognized educational television as well, and they tried to use it to, to their ends also. So, the question then is, and this is the key framing of, I think, a lot of your scholarship in this space. Um, we've discussed the technology. We've discussed the critiques across the spectrum um, of that status quo. Like What starts happening in the 1970s? Because I think the really key thing I want to pull out from reading your book is that if we just try to tell this story as the inevitable march of technology, we're going to miss the very specific policy choices, I think made in good and bad faith, they were then made over the next, let's just say 70s and 80s, so the next two decades, bring the like Nixonian to like Reagan administration decisions that were made here into the picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is something I found so fascinating is that when you start looking at the policy discussions about cable and cable's deregulation, you know, I argue that Nixon plays a really key role because he kind of changes these conversations about, you know, th this network monopoly and what's the, what's the problem and what are the solutions. So, um, you know, everyone could agree that it's too bottled up, right? That th there needs to be more access, more diversity of perspectives. Uh, but Nixon sees a solution very narrowly. He actually sees the problem very narrowly, too. He does think that it's elitist, but he thinks it's biased. Uh, he thinks it's liberally biased um, and liberally biased against him. Uh, you know, so he's combating what in he, he, his memos, they frame it as the, the, the network news problem. And so he's, you know, he's not worried about entertainment or programming as much, um, although he does pay attention to shows like All in the Family that can be critical of, of him and his base. Uh, but, uh, but he's framing this as a problem in the news. It's a problem about liberal media bias that's out, you know, the, the TV networks are out to get him. And then he sees it as only one solution, deregulation. We need to turn to the marketplace. Um, again, there are a variety of different options that were floated out there, you know, nonprofit, uh, foundation funded, you know, public options, all of these. But Nixon focuses in on we need to the marketplace and deregulation is the solution. And then sorry, not to interrupt, but just to be precise, um, 
that doesn't mean turn CBS, NBC, ABC into nonprofits. But what you're saying is if we now have, because this is what they're faced with, it's 1973, we now have this cable situation. We can add channels. It's not merely just about um, transmitting the status quo to people. What would that, so so like put the nonprofit alternatives like in that context. So like, would that mean that new channels would have to be like nonprofit? Like what, what, is, what does that mean? Well, so there were some uh, some ideas that emerged in uh, the late 1960s and the 1970s about public access, right? Like, so should uh, um, should. And there are even ideas about cable emerging as a common carrier uh, so that more people could have access and they wouldn't have to, you know, sell their programming to a company, but rather would have access to the medium itself without having to go through kind of a, a cable operator, right, that, that wanted to make money on programming and on subscriptions. So there are all of these different ideas about cable TV can be something different. Um, that what what is cable going to look like? That's different? What if it doesn't just extend? And broadcasting's reach, what if it actually provides a different model for how TV is produced and consumed? And, and so again, all of these different ideas are floated around um, in the Wired Nation. Uh, the, the writer, uh, Ralph Lee Smith, you know, really argued that the government needed to build this wired infrastructure uh, just the way they built the, the highway system during the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, that they, you know, they needed to make sure that everyone had access to this. Well, that's not what happens. Ultimately, private companies develop it. Um, and this is, uh, again, this comes out of Nixon's Office of Telecommunications Policy, where they're thinking about cables, uh, uh, cable as a solution, that we need to have more competition to broadcasting. So let's expand, let's let cable provide that competition. And, you know, private businesses will build the infrastructure, will sell their programmings, and will try to forge a business model that's fundamentally different from broadcast and that can challenge the pocketbook of broadcast. And that's exactly what cable does. Uh, you know, broadcast relied on advertisements uh, to, to underwrite its operations. Uh, cable companies rely on subscriptions, that they've got individuals that will pay a monthly subscription. So it's not quote unquote, free TV, as broadcasters would call their TV. It's something that you pay for every month and you can pay for better programming. HBO, right, um, is something that is you pay even more. You pay your basic cable subscription and then you pay more to get HBO. Um, and so this is really what Nixon and his OTP envisioned when they said, let the marketplace uh, triumph. It's let competition, let cable provide a private business alternative and see if people will pay for it and then see what happens. You know, it's really interesting just because in the way you're telling this, I kind of think, oh, hey, like, you know, a lot of that promise was filled by YouTube. Um, you know, we're going to post the video of this on YouTube. No one's going to, you know, I don't have to get anyone's permission to do that. I mean, actually, I kind of actually do. And this is kind of getting at the heart of the question. Um, to what degree has the internet fulfilled some of that early promise? Um, because like I just said, I'm just going to be able to upload this episode, but at the same time, like that's not publicly owned in terms of the, mm -hmm. everything from the infrastructure by which like I'm getting my, you know, Wi-Fi right now I'm using, you know, Google internet, um, at the same time, like YouTube is owned by Google. So how, to what degree has the internet fulfilled that promise like 30 years after that, that report? I, I, you know, I think that that's, that's, it's a really good question. Um, and I, I, you know, cable and the internet come together in really powerful ways by the late 1990s. Um, and that is a product um, of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that allows now mergers between these major um, uh, media industries of, you know, kind of different mediums can now come together. Uh, and, um, and so I think that, you know, cable was really central. Um, it, it built that, that wired infrastructure that we now rely on uh, for to get our internet. But uh, and I think that the internet does and um, it does kind of create these opportunities for anyone to, you know, to, to have their show, right? Anyone to, to have a TV show on YouTube. Um, and so I think that that's absolutely there. But there still are corporate dynamics uh, that shape uh, whose voices are elevated. Um, and, you know, you can have viral videos, right? But you, there are also, you know, algorithms that go in to some of these, you know, how these companies structure, uh, whose voices are, are prioritized. I would also add that, you know, something like uh, 
regulatory policy like net neutrality plays a role too. Um, that you know we all can have access to this internet and big corporations can't pay more to get a different tier. And so I think regulatory policies are still very much shaping um, how we understand the internet um, as well. And something I'd like to know is given the fact that aside from the very specifically nixonian um dynamics of his um attack on the big three networks and seeing deregulation as a means of doing that there are people across the ideological spectrum who agreed with this agenda so to what degree was the decentralized corporate status quo probably always going to happen if not in 73, in 77, like the, the Carter administration did plenty of deregulation in other categories as well, too. How do you kind of see the kind of, uh, I don't know, timeline going either way? Yeah, there are these deregulatory impulses that are very much at play in the 1960s uh, and the early 1970s across the political spectrum. And, and one of the things that I found really fascinating to kind of get back to some of the archival work and these policy discussions and how they unfold. And, and this is something, again, that begins with Richard Nixon's um, Office of Telecommunications Policy, but it expands in the aftermath of his administration, I think is another legacy, um, is that he's having economists shape these, these policy conversations, and increasingly only economists, uh, where previously they could be people from a range of backgrounds, perhaps lawyers, you know, who are thinking um, about other metrics of success. But for policymakers and their advisors in the 1970s, and this is across, again, it's not just the Nixon administration becomes the Ford and the Carter administration as well, but you're having economists that have a, more of a say in shaping some of these public policies and they're bringing the economic thinking um, about marketplaces. And, you know, many of these are economists that are, you know, trained in thinking about the free market and the importance of the free market. And they're bringing this to a range of policy um, conversations. So a big question I kind of just wonder, especially since you're an academic, what does it mean to be informed, right? Like in any type of these discussions, we're going to kind of throw it out there. But like, let's think of, January 6th, right? Like I would bet money that aside from the question of whether or not the election was stolen, a lot of folks who were there are probably like informed in the sense that they're like engaged in the news, like have opinions on public affairs, 100% they most likely voted in that election. So how do we understand like this? Because like, if we're going to kind of unpack, oh, like was this like this golden, you know, heyday of American engagement, I think we should understand like what we actually mean by informed in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a great question. And I, I think that, you know, when I talk about it with my students, you know, because this is a, a fundamental question that I, I think about a lot in my research, I think about a lot um, in the classroom, uh, when I'm teaching my students uh, about media literacy and how to unpack sources. I, I think it's, you know, looking at events from a variety of different perspectives. Uh, I, you know, I tell this to my students all the time, don't just trust one source, look at the evidence that they're using, look at, you know, um, I, I believe facts exist. <laughs> and, you know, but look at the facts, but know that they can be interpreted. They can be seen differently um, uh, based off of people's experiences and, and where they're coming from. And, and so, I, I, you know, to me, I would just say that, you know, being informed means critically thinking and, um, and really unpacking sources, um, understanding biases, and then being able to put enough of the pieces of the puzzle together to understand perhaps the stakes of an issue, whether it's a policy conversation, whether it's um, a restructuring of voting areas, you know, what, what's really going on? What are the stakes? And then what can you do? Is it about voting? Is it about protesting? Um, if, you, if you're not happy with the issue and how it's being resolved. Yeah. And what I love about that answer is that you are describing, quote, being informed as a, it's a kind of like a toolkit it's a means for like adjudicating throughout the world because it's also a good response to the cable news executive I was playing earlier because he or she would say, well, look, even in a Tucker Carlson hit, even in like a Rachel Maddow hit, even in a crossfire debate, you know, which Jon Stewart is dunking on back in 2004, there are all of these facts. So they could say that we're giving facts, therefore we're informing people. But the question is, separate from treating this like a multiple choice test, which, you know, that's not what civic life is. 
is this format or style of engagement with an audience actually giving you a toolkit to think through and like, you know, act democratically in any direction? And I'd say the answer to that is pretty strongly not um, in the great category. Um, so next question would be, and this is just, uh, I don't know how deep your research goes into this beyond just the book, but um, I'm interested in kind of the causal claim around cable news specifically playing a role in the fragmentation of America in the sense that if you look at, you know, the history of the way we tell the story of let's just say that was, was contained this to the, the Western world, Europe um, and North America, we'll talk about the rise of populism. We'll talk about Brexit. We'll talk about alternative for Deutschland, all these different like non-status quo parties. Um, these various revolts have occurred in countries that don't have um, a, like our cable news dynamic, but B, have entirely different conceptions of media and broadcasting. Think of the British and the BBC. I'm not going to even guess how the French and Germans work or the Italians, but how do we understand like the causal claim around fragmentation if it's kind of happening everywhere across different styles of media formatting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really, it's, that's a really great question. Um, and, and I think, you know, when I introduced this idea of fragmenting, um, I, I, to me, and in the kind of the role of cable news and in the fragmentation um, of America, I would say that it's cable news develops in a very particular way, in a way that ties it to the the, the business operations of the industry. So it emerges. In 1980, Ted Turner obviously is the first person to, you know, to launch a 24-7 cable network. And he is doing so, he calls it the cable news network because he is tying himself to the industry. Uh, the industry recognizes that having cable news is a way to gain favor with elected officials who want to be on TV more and, and make them more invested in the expansion of the cable industry. And so the deregulatory political environment environment, our policy environment, um, is shaping kind of the functioning of cable news, where again, it becomes all about these market metrics. Uh, that uh, that cable is now saying that we can make money. Uh, we we're we're going to make a lot of money, and the news can be profitable. Not as much that the news can you know um, uh, play a role in democracy, but it's about making money. And so I think that's something really uh, to emerge. Like in time and time again, when CNN was facing uh, um, economic struggles, cable operators came in. Uh, they they saved Ted Turner, Ted Turner multiple times because they saw this as a political tool to advance deregulation. And so the fragmenting, um, the kind of this role of fragmenting, this is something that the cable industry brings more broadly to American society, that people can have their own interests. Uh, they can have their own news channel, right? They can, But they can also have their own music channel. They can have their own golf channel. Um, and not pay attention to these other things. And so it's th this fragmenting that allows people to kind of organize um, in these niche groups uh, based off of shared interests um, and perhaps demonize other, other groups that don't share their interests because it's about kind of cultivating this loyalty to, um, to, to particular lifestyles, particular entertainment um, values or news values. And so that's kind of the fragmenting that I see as cable, the cable industry and cable news bringing in uh, more broadly kind of politics as a lifestyle choice um, and and bringing that that notion of loyalty um, and and again what you know people today would call tribalism I think is a very much a product of a particular business model that cable introduces yeah and I think the takeaway from your answer and putting it back in the terms of my question would just be that we could understand um, anti-status quo results in different countries as having let's say like a broad, um, unitary story, like we're in this kind of like post-globalization moment, like, you know, it's after the 1990s, but in specific countries, fragmentation or revolt are going to operate through different contexts. So in the American context, it operated through cable news. Like if we're in, you know, the UK, it would operate in a different fashion, et cetera, et cetera. So last two questions on cable news before we get to your work on Hollywood um, and politics real quick, which I'm really fascinated by. Um, this episode is coming out in a truly disastrous context for the cable news industry and like the cable format as a whole. Like there's this uh, Washington Post article that you were cited in um, that crazy statistic just to like contemplate, you know, in 2016, 70% of households with a TV had cable or satellite. Now it's only 40%. Um, 
that's like a why if it's just like think that, that, that's that's a wild um existential collapse. So given that collapse, um, two questions, we'll go do them one at a time. First question, now that the underlying unit economics no longer favor these formats long-term, they still have some life in them. They're still very profitable, but the formats need to be on the decline long-term. Is there an opening for these public, publicly curated, nonprofit, public access things if it is just revealed that streaming YouTube, advertising, et cetera, just can't actually support a diverse and interested news ecosystem. It's kind of like we're taking us back to that 1970s debate, except this time there's no clear way for economists to say, no, 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 like we could give you 24 seven news. Everyone just needs to pay X amount of money a month if people aren't even doing that in the first place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, and, you know, as a historian, I don't know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that we're having really important conversations about what we want out of our, our media, uh, what we what kind of ecosystem is going to be good for us as consumers, but also can, you know, be good for us as, as citizens. You know, there's a deep concern about misinformation and disinformation that is used to undermine democratic institutions um, at, at this very moment. So I think that these are really important conversations to have and to open up as many possibilities and pathways forward, you know, understanding that there are problems with, um, you know, publicly funded uh, media, right? Like there, there are issues in how that has un, un, uh, developed. There are issues with public access. That was always this golden democratic promise that never really emerged, uh, never really caught up with all the hype around it or, you know, re never really delivered. Um, that There are all of these possibilities. So let's learn from, you know, what they wanted to do, the, 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 the challenges perhaps they faced in actually executing that vision um, and, and kind of maybe think about new possibilities moving forward. And, um, and I think that's one of the things that I, I try to emphasize in the book is that, you know, these are choices. Uh, there are business pressures, certainly. There are political pressures, um, and those are overwhelming in some capacities, but they are malleable. And, and I think that these are, you know, TV emerged as a political institution uh, that, you know, the entertainment, um, or sorry, the internet has as well, but the future of this, are it's very much bound by the, the political and policy choices that we make today. And so, you know, I, I think that the, the future, we just need to be creative learning from the past and uh, about what works, what didn't work, and, and thinking about how to make perhaps different choices in the future. Yeah. And then my last question on this topic would be, how do you, and once again, you're a historian, so I'm not asking you to sort of sort forward, but um, I'm sure there's a word where you're writing about this book, writing about this topic 10 years from now. How do you just assess like the newly emerging, hyper-decentralized kind of post-cable news ecosystem? So something honestly, like on, on this podcast, you know, like I've had um, senators, I've had members of Congress, I've had, you know, I had the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau a few months ago. Um, at the same time, the side of me that's rooted in think tankery um, isn't quite as optimistic about decentralized formats because something that big cable companies have is the ability to provide cover. I mean, for example, like there's a reason why you don't see seriously interrogative, even like, I don't want to say hostile, but like aggressive interviews of public figures on podcasts, even big ones. Um, because if you're an independent channel, you basically care about the politician coming on in the first place. So if I'm going to have Senator Rubio on to talk about his book, I'm going to mostly talk about his book and not like get serious or aggressive because then he'll just never come on again and he'll cut me off. Now, if that happens on CNN, that doesn't matter. They have a massive business model. They have 30, 40 years of brand equity. Um, but I just really just see a real lack of promise given like those like structural realities. I think this mm -hmm. format's great for interviewing an academic. This is not great for a politician. Mm -hmm. Um, so how do you, I, I think despite his flaws, I think Joe Rogan is probably one of the only figures because of the size of his platform who could be aggressive with a politician. Um and keep that politician there because they know they need to be there. But guess what? 99.9% .9 of his of his programming is entertainment and culture focused. It's not political. If Joe Rogan were political, he would not be nowhere near as successful. So like, what's just your thought on like, that's just kind of like my thought on it, but like, what, what, what are your thoughts on it? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's such a great question. And um, and I think that that shows the, the political um, appeal of decentralized media for elected politicians or, or activists that want to get their point across and not be challenged, right? Um, and, and that actually, you know, it's interesting how you describe that. That's why elected officials went on cable TV, <laughs> um, because um, initially, you know, uh, someone like Tabitha Soren was not pushing back. Uh, against uh, Bill Clinton when he was on MTV News. It allowed him to really control the parameters of the conversation. It allowed him to actively bypass the Washington Press Corps, who were digging in and asking serious questions, digging, asking him questions, um, of a personal and ethical sca scandals, um, he, he was able to just say, you know what, I'm not going to deal with that. I'm going to go on cable and, and celebrate it as a way to direct or connect directly to the people. Uh, but it was always a way to, to, to control the conversation and to have more control over his image and how he wanted to present himself without getting those hard questions. So I, I don't know that that's an answer to the, the question. Well, um, I was asking I, about the dynamics, yeah. but that is an answer. The, the yeah. point is, the, 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 dynam the, 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 the point is, um, and you know, this is bad for the marketing of a lot of uh, independent creators. What you're really saying here is the dynamic. We've we've been here before, yeah. and that the dynamic of early pre-polarization. So once again, MTV, MTV is most definitely like seen as just like this liberal thing. But if it's like the early 1990s, obviously I think it was operationally going to lean left. It's once again based in like New York, but I think it was just like this neutral thing. I want to talk to young people, so I'm going to go on MTV. Um, the 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 dynamic there is is replicating itself. So okay, last. Uh, Big, big question because I'm fascinated by this. Um, you wrote a book called Showbiz Politics about like um, celebrity and politics and something that I actually kind of get here. And you could take this question wherever you want to go, but I actually get a lot of politicians who like after our episodes will say like, hey, like I'm thinking of doing like a podcast of my own. I think it's so cool how I can go direct to listeners, like obviously like leaning into the celebrity part of it. Um, so this is just clearly a dynamic that's kind of, that's kind of happening here. Um, can you just sort of like, once again, like as long as you need to go to finish out this episode, but introduce kind of like the showbiz politics idea. It's been, you know, almost 10 years since the book came out. And how are we seeing as we go into 2024, the 2024 election, this um, uh, showbiz ideal, like intersect with social media, podcasting, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, so th the first book really does kind of explore the collaboration between Hollywood and elected officials, right? And and and, and there are a lot of the same dynamics that I, I saw again when dealing with the cable industry. That you have Hollywood executives that want to gain political power and in favor with those people who are in office, who are you know really eager to to help Franklin Roosevelt sell his New Deal through these these small motion pictures. They're really eager to advise Dwight Eisenhower on how to use TV and kind of integrate, oh, Hollywood is going to help fight the Cold War through, um, you know, these ambassadors of democracy. So there's always that bottom line, uh, th that the economic um, interest is driving Hollywood mobilization. But because of decades of uh, collaboration between entertainers and elected officials uh, that I chart in the book from really the 1920s through the 1960s, I argue that you have the triumph of what I call the age of showbiz politics, where becoming a celebrity, uh, actively crafting oneself as a celebrity becomes seen as a path to political power. And this also kind of goes to the earlier question. Um, this is appealing to politicians because they can use entertainment to hype up their likability, uh, to gain more and more media attention to their campaigns, to their policy agendas without any critical pushback uh, from, from, from reporters asking them, you know, what's your stance on this? Rather, they can go on an entertainment show and talk about how they like to play the piano, or they can, you know, be Richard Nixon. He can go on laughing and say, sock it too me as a way to connect with voters. So again, it's a different way of bypassing the political and media establishment and communicating directly in an unfiltered way to voters that gives um, elected officials more, um, it, it gives them more control, but it also makes them more dependent on media um, and more dependent on television. And so that's one of the things where when I ended the first book, I thought of, you know, the first book really kind of shows how did people become how did parties, political parties and campaigns and presidential administrations 
why did they value celebrity so much? How did this happen? How did TV and image making become so central to political operations? And the book kind of charts out how and why that happened. And my new book now is looking at, well, what happens? What happens when someone like Richard Nixon sees his television image as central to him winning elections and govern as central to his political power? How does that perhaps shape some of uh, the way he sees new media? Um, um, and the way he thinks about communications policy uh, to make sure that it kind of fits in with that that vision. And that's really what brought me to the second book as well. So wrap up question that I'm fascinated by. Um, what do you see as the limit to politicians who want to become celebrities and celebrities who want to become politicians? Because I think this is interesting because, you know, JFK is on the cover of your book and, you know, as someone who's like an amateur um, JFK person, JFK is an interesting case because on the one hand, he does have um, the handsomeness of like a 50s, early 60s leading man. Um, so he's on, he's, uh, and he's stylish. So he's, he's on, he's above the norm in looks and style when it comes for a politician. At the same time, he's like very specifically um, like erudite and like academically oriented. And once again, like did he write profiles and courage? Like maybe yes, maybe no, but at a key level, he at least could do the press tour and come off as someone who wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book. Most politicians cannot do that. So kind of treating him, and then obviously you have the, the Kennedy-Nixon debates. So he to me seems to be like kind of like the apex of someone who's willing and able to balance both together. And obviously you have President Trump as an example of a celebrity who made the transition, but then you also have the disastrous Dr. Oz campaign um, in 2022. So how do you kind of see these dynamics playing out as you kind of do see people in both categories, politics and celebrity, trying to cross over very concertedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening all the time. And there are, are always speculations about, you know, who is the new entertainer uh, that is going to, you know, launch a, 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 a congressional bid or a bid for the governorship or, or whatnot, or a bid for the White House. Um, uh, and so I think it just you know, I always emphasize the importance of unpacking what celebrity does, right? It can perhaps, you know, someone's celebrity status might get them in the conversation. But I think one of the things that Trump's presidency really emphasized is that you need more than that to govern. I think it showed time and time again that he talked all about his ratings. He wanted to put on a good show, but he struggled to govern uh, because he was so obsessed with what helps you win elections may not always be central to governing. And, and I think his presidency made that very clear. And, um, and even though perhaps it motivated more celebrities to get involved in, in politics, I think it also has allowed us to ask better questions of those celebrity candidates um, and to, to kind of think through, you know, what are the qualifications they would bring? What are their platforms? And um, and so I think that we'll continue to see the celebrities getting involved in politics and politicians wanting to create their celebrity persona because it's central to how they get their media message out there. And um, and it's, it's become so ingrained in uh, the, the political process. Uh, I think the goal as voters Voters, as as citizens, um, is to be able to unpack how celebrity is being used and for what means, so that you can kind of again gain a better media literacy and understanding the candidates, what they're bringing to the table, um, and perhaps what they're not. That is an excellent place to end it. Katie, can you shout um, that um, showbiz politics and your latest book out for listeners who want to dive deeper? Great, thank you so much. Uh, my my newest book is Twenty Four Seven Politics. Uh, cable Television and the Fragmenting of America from Watergate to Fox News, I'm out now with Princeton University Press. And uh, my my other book is Showbiz Politics, Hollywood in American Political Life uh, with the University of North Carolina Press. Awesome. Thank you for joining me on The Realignment. Thank you so much for the conversation.